We need to pray to God and say, God, clear the path. Enlighten me. Show me what to do. Pray for that and God will grant us that, that gift. This week the Torah speaks about a special sacrifice called a Korban Toda, a thanksgiving offering. And the verse in chapter 7, verse 12, reads as follows. Im al toda yakrivenu, when one is bringing a thanksgiving offering, vikriv al zeva chatoda, and he shall offer this along with the thanksgiving. Chalot matzot beolot bashemen, going to bring un, unleavened loaves mixed with oil urkikem matzot mishuhim bashamin and unleaved, unleavened wafers anointed with oil vesolet murkevet halot beolot bashamin along with scalded flour mixed with oil and the mifarshim explain us that there were 40 loaves of bread that were brought along with this korban toda. And that is a lot of bread. And there was a time limit on this, on when to finish all of this. You could not leave over any of the korban in order to make sure that many people know about the miracles that are done for you and they come and they partake. Rashi quotes the Talmud and tells us, who are the people that need to bring a thanksgiving offering to express their gratitude to God? Who would this be? So Rashi says, as follows. It is a sick person, a person who traveled the ocean, a person who was freed from jail, and a person who traveled the desert. And in all of these cases they were saved or they were healed. These are the four people that are to make their and bring their offering, their thanksgiving offering. Our later commentaries, they give an acronym in order to remember which four and the acronym is Haim, life, because this person was given life. And how do we have Haim? Het, the first one for Chole, sick person. Yud for Yam. The second Yud for Yosheve Hoshech, as King David refers to the person who's sitting in the dark because he's in jail. And Mem for Midbar, which give you an acronym of Haim. So that's how you know life. That's how you know who are the four that thank God for the life that they've been given, that they've been spared. These are the four people. King David dedicates an entire psalm to these four people and the miracles that take place for them. The Zer Shimshon this week, very lengthy, yet so beautiful, especially in its original text in Hebrew, goes through understanding the majority of this psalm, Psalm 107 from King David, and we this evening are also going to spend a moment and learn it through the lenses of the Zera Shimshon. Nowadays, unfortunately, we do not have the temple and we're not able to bring this thanksgiving offering to express our gratitude to God. Yet something else was instituted and that is Birkat Gomel. Birkat Gomel is recited, it's a thanksgiving blessing. It's recited exactly for these four. If someone was healed after three days being bedridden in a very severe sickness, a person who travels the ocean or travels the desert, or as we know, flies nowadays, travels far, and also an individual who, again, none of us should know, but is released from, from jail, even if it's for money purposes or tax purposes, even if it's not a major crime, then in any of those cases, a person will make Birkat HaGomel when they come out of jail. Again, substituting the Korbanot for prayers, like all of our services that used to be taking place in the temple are now substituted for prayers and for study, so too is the Korban Toda, the Thanksgiving offering, substituted with, as we said, the blessing and the prayers and the, and the study. So let's look at the first verse and we're going to start, we're going to learn, we're going to learn it and we're going to interject the Zerah Shimshon's beautiful insights on this, on this psalm. Starting off with, Hodul Adonai Kitov, 
ki le'olam chasto. Let's praise and thank God because He is great, because His loving kindness is eternal. Second verse says, Yomeru ge'ule Adonai asher ge'alam miyadzar. Let those who have been redeemed and saved by God thank Him and say, say so because they were saved from Yad Tsar. Yad Tsar means a tormenting hand. It means a, a, a thin hand, a hurting hand. The Zerashim Shon asks, what an interesting type of terminology. Yad Tsar? It should have said Mitzara, from pain, from affliction. Why from a tormenting hand does he ask? And he answers and says, in life, we all understand danger, we understand pain. We understand danger in the four examples that we spoke about just recently. And that is again, the one who travels, whether it's by water or by desert or sick and healed, or even the one who gets relieved and, and, and saved, and, sorry, um, taken out, released from, from jail, okay? But that is not the only danger. That is a physical danger. Miyad Tsar, from the hand of the tormentors, the Zerashim Shon explains that to be from the hand of the Satan. The Satan, the Yetzirara, the evil inclination. Sometimes we mistaken and we only think that there are physical occurrences that could hurt somebody and hold us back from doing the right thing or cause pain and danger. King David is telling us that the source for all of the things which are not perfect in this world is because of the Satan, because of the Yetzir Hara. From that very first time that Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge and interjected a certain amount of confusion and evil into this world, the Yetzir Hara, the Satan, is just doing its job. It's doing what it's supposed to do. Now we need to do what we have to do. We have to fight that battle, overcome it physically, spiritually, emotionally, and in every which way possible. King David, the Zerashim Shon says, Miyad Tsar, so that we know that it's at least equal, if not more, all of that spiritual danger that we have that is caused by the Satan and also by the Yetzir Hara. Moving on to the next verse. The next verse, verse 3 says, Ume'aratzot ki bitsam. And God gathered them from all of the lands. Mimizrach umimarav. From east to west, mitzafon umiyam. And from north to south. This is the end of the first section of the psalm. These first three verses is the end of the first section of the psalm. Now, the Zerashim Shon asks, what does it mean, Ume'aratzot ki betzam, that God is gathering everybody from all the lands? What does that mean? What's he talking about? What's King David talking about? We just said, praise God for his eternal, his eternal loving kindness. All those who have been saved and redeemed, say so. Because God, that's the third uh, verse now, because God collected everybody together, gathered everybody from east to west, north to south, where does that fit in, the Zerashim Shon asks. He answers by quoting a Gemara in Masechet Rosh Hashanah. Masechet Rosh Hashanah, again, obviously speaking primarily about the head of the year, the Rosh Hashanah holiday, and the other times of Rosh Hashanah, analyzes two different verses. One verse being in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 7, and I'll quote, it says, for what great nation is there that has God so near to it? As the Lord our God is at all times that we can call upon Him. So the first verse that the Talmud quotes and is going to ask a question on the next one, it says, basically, that any time a person calls out to God, God is there. He'll be listening and He'll be answering. The Talmud now brings a second verse and now questions. 
The verse is in Yeshayahu chapter 55, verse 6. says as follows, Dirshu Adonai behimat Seek God when He is found. Kira'uhu biyoto karov call to Him when He is near. So the first verse is telling us God is always available, God is always listening, God will always answer. The second verse in Yeshayahu, the Talmud asks, seems like only when God is close can you approach Him. And will He listen in here? And the Talmud explains that that second verse in Yeshayahu is talking about the ten special days as we know, Aseret Yemet Teshuvah, the ten days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah being day one and two, the next seven days of the intermediate days, and then the tenth day, so two plus seven, that's nine, and the tenth day being Yom Kippur. Those are the ten most special days of the year. And those are the days where the Talmud explains, says, a person can come out and, call, and be close and call out to God. So the Talmud answers and says, when can a person call out to God and he's always listening? That's with the community. That's with a minyan. That's in a large amount of people. When can a person come and call out to God and he'll be listened even as an individual? During the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur because they're very, very special days. And that's how it reconciles the question of, well, is he always available or not? He's always available in a group. He's available as an individual sometimes or specifically during the 10 days of repentance at the beginning of every year. With this, the Zerah Shimshon brings another Gemara, another Talmud to answer his question. And says the Talmud in Masechet Barachot, that when a person prays for something, whether it's for someone else, whether it's for yourself, for anything at all, make it an all-inclusive prayer. Include others in your prayer. This is, by the way, one of the most important and powerful tactics when it comes to prayer and specifically the prayers of the high holidays as we just mentioned to always include others in your prayer i'll give you an example when you're praying for the the refuah shlema the healing and curing of an individual whether it's someone else or yourself don't just pray for that person rather say betoch shar hole amo israel amongst the rest of the sick Jewish people. Whether it's for yourself or for someone else, that's fine. If you're praying for Parnassah, don't only pray for your Parnassah, don't only pray for whoever it is you're praying about Parnassah, pray for collectively the Jewish people's Parnassah. Peace, health, happiness, traveling. You're traveling. You're on a plane. You're doing Tfilat HaDerech. Are you the only one on the plane? Are you the only one traveling? You know, what if, what if, what if you're on a plane with, your, with an enemy, God forbid, and you pray for, for you to have a safe trip and only you to have a safe trip and, and not for your enemy? What does that mean? Is that the only plane flying? Is it the only boat out to, sh- out to sea? The only person driving intercity? People are constantly traveling. Whenever we pray for someone else, the Talmud tells us, include others in your prayer. It doesn't hurt. And more importantly, it gives you the aspect now of it becoming a collective prayer. And this is how the Zerah Shimshon answers. What's verse 3 in the Tehilim telling us? What does that mean? That God gathered us from all corners of the earth. It means... That when each and every individual, one of these four individuals, again the traveler in the water or the desert, or the sick person who needs, who needs a refuah lima, or the person that's in jail, when they're calling out in their struggle, when they're calling out for help, God, who performs a miracle to that person, is not the only miracle being performed. There's many sick people. There's many people in jail. There's many people traveling. All of them need a miracle. When that individual calls out and cries, he or she may only be thinking of themselves. 
But because of their sincerity that they're calling out to God, God takes all these sincere, even selfish individuals, let's put it that way, and He collectively puts them all together, and He makes it as a group, giving them the collective advantages of prayer opposed to the individual's prayer. And that's what the Zerashim Shon says David was referring to by from all the lands, from all the countries, all the cities, anyone in jail, anyone traveling, anyone sick, put all of their prayers together and made a miracle for all of them on behalf of their collective unity, even though they might not have that intention. That's pretty serious. Let's move on to the second section of this Mizmor. We are in verse 4. The first of the, of the four individuals that we said King David speaks about is the individual traveling by desert. And that is verses 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And we're going to read them, learn them, and understand them right now. This individual is lost. He's traveling and he can't find his way. He cannot find a city. Five. He's hungry. He's thirsty. He's exhausted. He's lost. Number six. Vaitzaku el Adonai Batsar Lahem Mimitsukotehem Yatsilem. And the person, Vaitzaku, screams out. This person who's traveling in the desert and he's lost and he's starving and thirsty and exhausted screams out to God in his distress. And God, Yatsilem, saves him, rescues him. Pay attention, you can circle the words. Vaitz Aku and Yatsilem, because we're going to analyze the other f- three individuals. In verse 6, Vaitz Aku and Yatsilem. Verse 7, Vayadrichem Bederech Yeshara, Lalechet El Ir Moshav. And then God, when He's going to rescue them, He finds them the right way how to continue, and He helps them get to their destination. And then that person will, Yodu la Adonai Adam, will praise God and thank God and let it known to, be, uh, to others what God has done. And then nine, Ki nefesh miletov, because God has now sustained the hunger and the thirsty and the exhaustion of this individual. Mm-hmm. So these verses is speaking about the traveler in the wilderness, in the desert. Very important to notice, as the Zerashim Shon points out, the terminology of Vaitz Aku screaming, and then Yatsilem from the word Hatsala, being saved and rescued. Okay? Now let's go on to the next individual King David speaks about, which is the person who is in jail, starting at verse 10 and going all the way through till verse 16. And let's read it. Yosheve Hoshech Vitzalmavit, the one who's sitting in dark, in his in his almost to his to his end, Tzalmavit, to, towards his death. Asire Oni Ubarzel, who's tied up and, and held behind even iron. Eleven. Kihimruhim Reel Vatsat Elyon Naatsu. He has no way out. He's stuck over there. Twelve. He has no one to help him. He's downtrodden. 13. Not vayitzaku, vayizaku, which means to cry out in a scream. Circle that word. And then God saves him from his distress. Circle the word yoshi'em, because it's different. Yoshi'em comes from the word hosha'a. Moshiach, salvation. And then 
14, God takes the person out of his darkness, out of his being tied up. And then the person will say, will, will say praise to God and let it be known to others. And then Tedzain, then the doors of his jail, he will, will break open and then he will be let out once and for all. The third of the four individuals King David speaks about, starting in verse 17, is the sick person, the chole. The sinners have become blind and, and, and hurt and hurting and harmed from their sins. 18. Nothing's helping them. They're trying everything to be saved, but they're still sick. They're getting to the gates of death. 19. This person's crying out, screaming again, crying. Not only screaming. And then he is saved. Again, the terminology of salvation. And then God saves, that's the guy, sends him a final healing, comes out, thanks everyone. And then, And that is the end of the sick person. That is the 20, at the end of the 22nd verse. The Zer Shimshon asks, why is it that this verse, this psalm, is using so many different terminologies between each and every one of them? And as we're going to soon, now we're going to see with the person traveling by water. What does it say? It says that he's screaming, and then it says, Yotziem. Look at the verse 28. Vayitzaku, he's screaming out, El Adonai Batzalahem, Umi Mitzukotahem Yotziem. And then he's taken out. The first. By the one traveling in the desert, it says God Yatsilem rescued him. Hatsala. By the second two, by the second and the third, by the one in the in the in the in the jail and the one who's sick, it used the terminology of Yoshiem, salvation. And the last one by the ocean, the terminology is Yotsiem that he was taken out. The Zerashim Shon is trying to wrap his head Ha, wrap his head around why is King David not being consistent therefore they're all in dangerous situations they all need to bring sacrifices a thanksgiving sacrifice why the difference so listen to what he says he makes an observation and he says one traveling in the desert what is the greatest danger when traveling in the desert believe it or not it's not the heat and it's not the cold and it's not the water it is either robbers or animals being ambushed either by a group of thieves and robbers or by animals is the most dangerous thing when traveling in the desert, whether you're alone or not. And that's the way to travel back in the day. It wasn't like nowadays with highways. So what is the terminology? Yatsilem. They were rescued. When one is traveling in the desert and they get to their destination safely, they were rescued, terminology of Hatsala, from either animals or robbers. Then the fourth one by the ocean, it says Yotziem. You know what Yotziem comes out from? It comes from the word Latzet, to go out. What does that mean? When a person is traveling at sea, a storm comes up. A person cries out to God. The storm goes away. God listens. Does it mean that he's saved? No. A person is only saved from the ocean when they're back on dry land. Until they have been taken out. Vayotzi em. Only once they've been taken out of the ocean. That's why King David used that terminology. But now, if I may say so, the most fascinating interpretation of all is the next terminology of Yoshi'em, coming from the word salvation. The root of the word Yoshi'em, or Lehoshia, Hosha'a, is Shu'a, Shin, Vav, Ain. Shin, Vav, Ain is also, in some fashion, 
the root of the word shomea. Taken out the mem, you have again shin, vav, and ayin. To the fact that when a person prays to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and God listens to that individual, that is a salvation. But listen to the grand novelty from this interpretation. That these two people, that the terminology of Yoshiyam, of salvation is used by, by the one who is freed from jail, and by the one who is, fr- who is, who is healed, this individual, these two individuals, first either do or could put their trust in another human being, in another human being who has free will. One who's sick, what do they do first? They run to the doctor. They get diagnosed. They buy their medicine. They get a dietitian. They start working out, start watching what they eat. They're putting their trust in someone else. Someone who's in jail. We should not know of it. Who's holding them back? The guard. If they find a way to bribe the guard or get on the guard's good side, maybe they'll get free. Maybe it's the judge. But they're putting their trust in another human being. Another human being who has free will to decide as they wish. So what happens? When a person puts their trust in God, even when it's not 100%, because it's partly in the doctor, partly in God or partly in the hands of the judge, or the jail keeper, and then partly in God. Even when we're not 100% with bitachon in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, with the trust that God will save us, He still answers. That's why, Yodu l'Hashem chasdo ki niflotav, ve adam. We thank God for His ultimate kindness, His ultimate chesed, because even when we're not 100% in trust with Him, and we place part of our trust elsewhere, He'll still answer us. And this is the difference of the terminology between each of them. That's why we have Yatsilem, Yoshiem, and Yotsiem, each one being different. It's interesting to note that King David's order and the Talmud's order for these four four individuals that are in danger are not the same. So let's just repeat, King David's order is desert traveler, person who was in jail and was freed, a sick person, and then a person traveling the ocean. The Talmud uses a different order, and the Zerashim Shon challenges and says, why the difference of order? The Talmud's order is first traveling by ocean, then traveling by desert, then a sick who was healed, and then one who was in jail and released. Absolutely no correspondence and similar order to the order that King David uses. And obviously King David came before the Talmud. So why the difference? Zerashim Shon answers in a beautiful fashion. He says, King David chose the order that he chose because that was the order of occurrences since the creation of the world. And he explains exactly how. He says, Why first the Midbar? Who traveled in a desert first? Ishmael. Ishmael went to the Midbar. He went hunting. And he came back. Who was next? Next was the the Chavush. The one who was in jail. Who was in jail? Joseph. The next was... Who was sick first? And we'll elaborate on this a little later. King Chizkiyahu. King Chizkiyahu was the first individual to ever get sick. I'll explain what that means. We'll soon get to it in a moment. And then the fourth traveling in the ocean was Jonah, the prophet, Yonah. This order was the order King David went in, the order of the occurrences of the world. Ishmael, Yosef, then Chizkiyahu, and then Yonah. What order did the Talmud choose? 
the Talmud chose, as we say in, he, as in, in Hebrew and in, the, and in the Talmud, Diber Behove. It was speaking about the right now. Right now they were in Israel. What was going to be? They were going to leave. Because of exile, because of travel, or for whatever reason. How does a person leave Israel back in the day? First option was going to the ports. Zvulun, who was in charge of the ports, passing through there to get to the ocean. Ocean first, yam. Next, how could you get to Babylonia, which where they were heading to? By desert. That's the second. Third, what is a natural occurrence of traveling? The Talmud says, it wears a person down. Traveling wears a person down and a person is more open to getting sick. That's the third person that the Talmud ran, uh, uh, speaks about. And then the fourth of being jailed is when the Jewish people will be out of Israel and will be in exile. They'll be oppressed and unfortunately thrown into jail and then saved from that. So the two orders each have a specific one. The one of King David, which was the occurrences of history in, in proper chronology, and the one of the Talmud on basically how one was able to travel out of Israel or going to travel out of Israel back in the time of the Talmud. Now, if we see by all four of these individuals, if you, for example, if you go to verse 8, if you go to verse 15, verse 21 and verse 31, all say that we will thank God for His loving kindness and His wonders. Livne Adam, and let it be known to people. The Zer Shimshon answers, asks, he wonders, why do we need to tell everybody? What does it mean, tell people? We know that you need to tell people. He says, there is a specific mitzvah that when a person has a miracle done to them, even if you might think it might be simple, even if you think that it could have been worse and thank God it didn't get worse. But if a miracle was done to you, let it be known to others. Publicize it. Make it to do. You had an inspiration from it. You might have not had that big of an inspiration for it, but you might be able to inspire others by the miracles that God performed for you. Don't keep the miracles God performs for you a secret. Let it be known to others to inspire them to delve more into God more into the Torah, more into our, our heritage. And the last thing we're going to speak about, and this is, is absolutely a, a, an astonishing question. If we look at all four of the people that King David is speaking about, only one of them, does he say, brings a sacrifice. Yet we learned already that all four need to bring a thanksgiving sacrifice. So why does King David only refer to the sick individual who was healed to bring a sacrifice? Look in verse 22. Speaking about a sick person. This individual, this person, after thanking God, is going to bring a sacrifice. But all four need a sacrifice. Why only this, only this one being sick? He brings the Midrash. The Midrash tells us that Hizkiyahu HaMelech was the first to ever get sick and be healed. Let's just understand what that means. Until the time of Abraham and Isaac, nobody aged. We've spoken about this before. There was no balding, there was no graying, turning white, wrinkles, maybe losing eyesight, hunching over. We never aged. Abraham, finally, at the age of 100, gives birth to Isaac. Now, after so many years of not having a son from Sarah, his wife, the world started speaking and said, Sarah must have cheated on Abraham and had this boy from another man. So what did God do? God made Isaac look like an identical twin to his father who was 100 years older. 
And Abraham now and Isaac are traveling. And they're in the city. And people don't know who's who. So Abraham goes to God and says, God, look what you've done. You've done something great, yet you've done something short of great. Something wrong, maybe. God says, yeah, you know what? You're right. From now on, we'll make you age, and everyone will be aging from now on, too. Hezkiyahu HaMelech was the first individual to get sick and be healed. Hezkiyahu HaMelech saw in prophecy that he would have a horrible descendant. King Minashe, which was known to be one of the worst kings the Jewish people ever had. So what did he do? He abstained from having children. He did not get married. He got sick over that. The prophet came to him and said, God's mad at you. Get married, have a kid. He said, I can't. And he got sicker and sicker. Until finally the prophet and him made a deal. Said, give me your daughter. Between your marriage and my marriage, hopefully we can over, overrule this prophecy of this horrible descendant coming. And he was healed. Prior to Hiskiyahu. Hiskiyahu, just so we know, lived between the years 715 B.C. until 686 B.C. That is a long time ago. That's approximately 2,700 years ago. That means only since then have people been getting sick and being healed. Prior to that, anyone who got sick was terminally ill and was for sure dying. BCE. BCE. BC. No, before Christ. Before. Okay. Now, 2,000. 700 years. Okay? Now, anyone who used to get sick would die immediately. Hiskiyahu came and he prayed to God to now heal him. He was the first one to be granted. At the time of the giving of the Torah, the Jewish people were not getting sick and healing. Someone got sick, they died right away. So King David saw in his prophecy, because Hezekiah was obviously after David, that in the future, the Jewish people, mankind, are going to get sick and be healed. Specifically to them, they should know that they will have to bring a sacrifice for being healed. The other three were obvious. That was taking place already before. But the sick person was not applicable when the Torah was given. And when this, when this was given to the Jewish people, King David prophesied and said, there will be one day when people will get sick and healed. They will also have to bring a korban, a, an offering. This psalm is, by the way, very confusing until we looked at it and learned it according to the Zerah Shimshon. By no coincidence is this the psalm that in a week and a half we will be reciting every day on Passover. Can you imagine? Out of 150 psalms, the psalm of Passover is Psalm 107. Why? Psalm 107 describes exactly what God did for the Jewish people. The first, traveling the desert. God helped us travel the desert. He saved us. In jail, we were jailed and slaved by the Egyptians. And he saved us. Sick. We were sick. We would have died. We had no sustenance. We had no, no, no success. We were sick individuals. God healed us. And from the ocean, God opened the sea and saved us from the sea as well. That's why we speak about, and we, that's why we read specifically this psalm on Passover. But what, we just read it to recount what happened? No. 
we read it to recount what happened, but also to be aware that God still does that for us nowadays, in 2018. Each of us in our own ways, whether it's traveling, whether it's being sick, whether it's being really in jail, or whether it's being in, a, in an emotional jail, or psychological uh, setbacks. God is here. King David said forevermore, say this, Talim, referring to Egypt, but referring to nowadays as well. These four people who are in danger are not limiting to those situations. Of course, those are the situations where someone would bring a Thanksgiving offering. But any miracle that happens to us, any struggle that we overcome, is an opportunity for us to acknowledge God's intervention, His presence, His blessing, and His 